Um, so we'll we'll go ahead and begin. Um, what was what we wanted to do tonight was to talk about the um, the BIPOC proposal that we are submitting to the state of Virginia for funding, and sent that around for comments. A number of y'all put in comments, and really appreciate that. And wanted to go over the um, the uh, outline of our plan and what we're looking to do uh, if we receive funding from the state, uh, and get input from you all about what you all think. You know what can be added, what's missing, what's strong, um, and uh, just general comments. Uh, and as usual, you know these grants. You know, you find out about them and, it, and it's a rush to apply for them. It's due on Thursday of next week. Mm -hmm. But with any of these, once we have one of these written, you know, hopefully we'd get this one. But if we didn't, we'd, you know, we'd be able to incorporate your all's ideas into the next uh, uh, next grant that we apply for. So I we feel like this is a really strong proposal and it's something that we want to incorporate into all of our work, you know, both the, um, in the research on the burial ground with what, what we're doing with the archaeology and the oral history. But this is, you know, this same ethos of having a, having not doing research for research sake, but doing uh, community based research is what we want to move forward with, with our partnership between the MDC and the Montpelier Foundation. So um, in a, I'll go over, you know, what the, the timeline would be for this if, you know, and what we're asking for in the grant. The grant wouldn't, um, looks like the grant wouldn't start until sometime in the late fall of this year if we received it, you know, by the time we get notification and uh, we're able to start um, uh, doing the work on the grant. And so what we'd look to do in terms of a timeline is uh, begin to do um, outreach, uh, you know, that we're already doing, uh, but specific to the um, uh, to this project, and that would be getting a, a group of um, Montpelier descend descendant advocates together to plan for training in the spring of 2024, and so this would be both for training for, and this would be to you know. It employ uh, descendants on the on the payroll either of the you know the MDC and the Montpelier Foundation to work with us on conducting oral history and doing the archaeology. And I'm going to explain that the the, um, the archaeology portion, and then Becca will explain the um, the uh, um, the oral history part. And these two for the this for this for the burial ground work hand in hand uh, because the the oral history would be providing the research questions that we'd be testing through the archaeology. So for the archaeology, we'd do this through the Montpelier Foundation, but we'd the Montpelier Foundation would contract through the MDC for this work. And what we do is in the um, uh, you know fall through winter, we'd um, uh, get a group of about uh, 10 individuals. Uh, they wouldn't have to be you know, living local, it would uh, be, it could be folks that wanted to come and, and participate in the programs. But as advocates, what their role would be, would be to know enough in the case of the archaeology about what we do with the archaeology, to be able to promote the programs or, you know, the expedition programs in the, in their community, in the community, among their, among their relatives, and hopefully get more people to participate in the program. And then during the programs, be present, um, you know, with about, uh, our goal is to get about 10 uh, MDAs, Montpelier Descendant Advocates, um, who would be spread out on the programs that we run, the, you know, the one-week programs uh, throughout the year. And during the programs, you know, they would be participants in the programs, but then would be um, on call, if you will, to answer questions about you know, the MDC, about the, you know, the MDC's views on, you know, what we're, what we're all doing in the burial ground with the archaeology, um, uh, you know, address issues that might come up about, um, you know, observing what we're doing and in terms of the archaeology, our interaction with expedition members, give advice on that and be, um, you know, a uh, essentially an, an advocate for the MDC in the archaeology work that we're doing, and it, it would really ensure that um, 
in the in in this case and doing the work in the burial ground that we uh treat that space in a way that is respectful and the mdc is comfortable with and then make it into um a, a safe space for descendants and for um the work that we're doing um and does it does this cover um becca what you know we we're, we've been thinking about this is Henry's given us some uh, echoes. <laughs> Henry. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I, uh, I got off my phone onto the computer. That's what happened. Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, it does actually. Um, and then uh, some of the other things that we're um, trying to do. Uh, should we get this funding is, you know, provide, again, the training, but also uh, for any uh, MDC member who is interested in, uh, you know, going through a GIS certificate course um, uh, through the University of Richmond, um, again, uh, we would pay for that, we'd be given like a, a stipend. Um, and yeah, I think that, I think those were the highlights of of, of what we were, were working on right now. I'm sorry, it's been a really long day. Oh, no, so that's so. fine, Becca. And that, that's <laughs> that's for that's just for the archaeology. It would also, you know, it oh, yeah, yeah. cover the oral history. But yeah, that, yeah. for the for Alex for the um for the uh certificate pro certificate program for the GIS, we're we were looking at two things with that. One is that um we would hope that this uh MDA program could be used for, you know, the MDC members that are in the MDC today, but then also potentially be um, a potential career path for high school students. And the GIS might mm -hmm. be something that could encourage high school students to be who are descendants and local community members like the Orange County African American Historical Society to, to be to become MDAs. And the, the other part of the G, of GIS is is that if you under understand how we collect the GIS data, not necessarily you know the technical part of it, but understand what is accessible through GIS. What this means is is that um, the GIS, since it's online, is basically a a, um, a live access to the excavation. So as we do excavations, we take photos of the excavations. As we encounter, say for example, grave shafts, there's a photograph in the field and those are immediately uploaded to into GIS. And you know, with the story maps, there's there's fairly accessible ways to um, make those available, but having the um, MDAs be part of this process we feel like there'd be ways that um, there the suggestions could be made to make it even more accessible once you know descent you know the members of the of the of the MDC and the OCHS see how this how these how this works this format works there would be ways that uh, there would be better suggestions that we can make given that you know when you're in the middle of it and you're you know all the details of it sometimes you get lost in the weeds you don't you can't see the forest for the trees so. Um, this would be again a way to um, to to give the MDC and OCHS members um, a way to give input into what we're doing, and then also to value it to say that you know this isn't just something we're doing that's out of obligation. It's not something that we're doing as as just uh, checking the box. This is part of who we are and what we're doing, and so we want we're paying people to do this because it's. You know, it's what how we want to change our research focus is to have it be community based. So, an analogy of this is when we um, many years ago, Dennis Bajorkland, who's our metal detectorist, he came on an expedition program and he spent two weeks with us or a month with us doing metal detecting, and I, and he wanted to continue to volunteer. And I was like, Dennis, you can't because we need you. We got to pay you. You know, when you need someone, you pay them, and we need. The involvement of the community in this to make this into a community-based archaeology project. And then the other part is the oral history. And uh, Becca, I'll let you cover that. Yeah, so again, um, 
And I just actually really want to add on real quick to Matt's, uh, to what Matt was just saying. It's also another way um, that's, for me anyway, really incredibly important of lifting this community up. I mean, if if you take the skills, the training, the GIS certificate, whatever, if you take it and use it towards, you know, helping Montpelier in whatever way, awesome. But if you, these are valuable skills. And I mean, if you take them somewhere else, even better, you know, um, because I mean, knowing GIS, being able to manipulate data that way, it's just, it's, it's a valuable skill. So, um, but as far as oral histories go, again, so the training would, um, um, again, I'm trying to make, I'm hoping that this will encourage sustainability, right? So even after we're all, you know, dust in, on the wind, people will be able to continue this work. So, mm -hmm. Um, as far as the trainings go, it'll be kind of some of uh, the theories behind oral histories, the different types of his oral histories that you can take, um, some of the legal ramifications that you have to consider in order to, you know, conduct um, oral history research, how to translate oral history research into kind of like an academic setting if for anybody who wants to, you know, um, as well as, you know, kind of considerations about the equipment that uh, we need to use in order to conduct these and making those that equipment available to local descendant members so that they can do this practice on their own if they if they so choose. Um, setting up data databases and how how and who we want this um, data stored for. Um, those kinds of those kinds of considerations and trainings, workshops and, and trainings. That that was that's the scope of what I'm looking at. Okay. And then outside of the MDAs, these would be you know the um, descendants that would be um, paid by Montpelier for their work. The other part of the funding would be to uh, provide travel stipends for uh, descendants for coming on expeditions um and uh that that would be you know you know coming as a you know, allow people to come as a participant because what we're hoping is that with having the mdas there would be um more of a familiarity of what we're doing in this case with the archaeology and there'd be a higher comfort level about coming to montpelier because you know if, um if uh you know, there one of one of the MD MDC members is employed by Montpelier and the MDC. It's probably going to make you know their friends and relatives be curious about what they're doing, ask questions, and uh, encourage others to to come on the program and and to facilitate that. Would want to make uh, travel stipends uh, available, and and with all this, the other other part of this is as as um, you know, the MDAs become more familiar with our programs, it's going to lead to suggestions on how to, you know, different kind of programs we can do to make these accessible, like we were talking about the last time. Is, a, you know, is a full week the thing to do? Is it a couple of days? Is it a, is it a tour that would be led by, uh, by MDAs on the site that, you know, at the burial ground? Um, are there um, uh, festivals or um, uh, activities where MDAs could present the information, you know, in, in both with oral, you know, oral histories and the uh, archaeology that would encourage others to to join, you know, the um, the efforts of what we're doing. So, again, it's just to, to get more involvement and to um, to show that we value this involvement and it's part of who we are becoming is to provide, you know, the uh, the you know. Paying for it and and putting it putting a um, uh, a uh, a formal role uh, with all this, okay. but would love your all's thoughts and um, and just first impressions or second impressions or what you all think might be missing. What we're uh, what else could be added to this? Um, can I ask a question before you get the feedback? Because um, I'm obviously not in the background of many people on this call. As you look at things right now, what do you and Becca think are the biggest impediments to getting a thumbs up on this? Hmm. You mean from the from the funder, from the state of from, Virginia? From, from, from the funder, yeah. I mean, are there things that 
uh, you're kind of your, uh, we've got to get over this hill or over that hill. I mean, is there, is there a little bit more from us, from somebody that would help, you know, push it over the mountain? Um, I think, I think what, what I, if I was reviewing this grant, mm -hmm. what I would, you know, and what, uh, also we, we've talked about is that, you know, what, support is there from the community and interest from the community to do this you know so if we received the grant would we actually be able to have 10 individuals that by the spring of 2024 would be interested in, in being you know employed at Montpelier to be you know to take part in the expeditions and also to be employed at Montpelier to work with Becca on doing the oral histories um you know, so it'd be one thing to get the money, or, but are the people there? And we, we've, we've put you all forward as an initial group that we, is interested in this process, and that's why we wanted to have this call to okay. make sure that we were, you know, not using your all's name in vain and to get input. So mm -hmm. that uh, that's my concern. What Becca? What do you what What do you say? Um, Actually, I don't. I honestly didn't have. I didn't have a concern. I mean, I, I've gone to the, you know, information sessions for this grant, and I think that we have an incredibly strong case Good. for getting that money, um, hmm. not only with, you know, structural parity, but we're, we're fulfilling a need, mm -hmm. um, a need that, you know, um, I think Montpelier needs desperately. So I, I, I've actually, I, that is a really good, great question. I just kind of assumed we had a really great shot. Um, but that's just me. All right. Well, you know, Iris, I see her waving. Yeah, her finger. I think yeah. that um, we know from the parity struggle that there are a lot of um, foundations, other uh, organizations that support what we're trying to do. So I think the hurdles, not just for this. Um, effort, but for efforts in the future are just getting people involved from the descendant community, if that's a hurdle yeah. at all, because people are busy and not everybody wants to do archaeology or oral history, but we've got to find those people because we know that funders are interested. Mm -hmm. We know that. So I'm like the like Becca. I don't. I don't. I don't see a problem with that. Mm -hmm. What about you, Terry? Hi, everybody. Um, gosh, I guess uh, I might if if I if I was putting on my a hat that is outside of Montpelier, and you know, because it's. I I might almost be worried that people might not completely understand what we're trying to do with <laughs> with the grant, um, not because it doesn't explain it well, but simply because it's in I think in classic MDC TMF fashion, it's it's on the edge um, and and pushing boundaries. Uh, so I think that that's one thing that might, you know, I was just looking over some of the articles about the launch of the grant um and and some of that stuff uh, uh and and i think we do this pretty well in some of the language but like it's this weird thing right where often the shippo and dhr is concerned about sites that are under threat mm -hmm. and and so in in this very like odd way that is very much dhr archaeology speak the thing that is making the archaeology necessary the thing that is causing the threat is the construction of a memorial that doesn't mean meaning that it's a threat to the heritage right it's a, if you build something physical anything on a burial ground you might be impacting the burials right um uh so so you know it may also just be like what is the grant up against right is there something where the the threat to a historic uh, BIPOC site is an impending highway or a, you know, a site that's eroding out of the um, 
you know, eroding into the Atlantic Ocean or mm-hmm. something like that, right? Um, that so so there's there's that element too is we don't know what the grant's up against. Um, so those are just a couple of the things that you know are I think largely out of our control, um, mm-hmm. but uh, but are uh, you know things that I think reviewers will be thinking about because there is only so much money o- only five million dollars right to pass around. yeah so. but there's a possibility of getting an additional like if the budget virginia mm-hmm. state budget or something like that gets passed at the um dhr will get an, an additional right. five million and i mean i could see them saying matt you know like what you said is is you know we're not able to give you money for 10 people, but we're able to give you money for five people, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or something like that. So so in some ways, like being real specific about those numbers might be helpful in the application so that, so that they can say like, oh, yep, we can't do that, but we can do this. So we can still give you 750,000 mm-hmm. instead of a million or something like that. So. Yeah. One one thing that um, when uh, Becca and Allison and I spoke to the uh, state person, we asked, you know, we're, we're asking for a um, million dollars for this grant, and and part of this would be covering the archaeology work, and what um, we uh, also uh, want, asked them was that if we only were able to receive half of this amount, if that would make it a more successful grant. You know, how would we um, indicate that, you know, what we'd want to cut and what what we would like for what we would want to cut in order to, I feel, to make this successful would be, it sounds bizarre, but the archaeology funded portion out of it and keep the community, you know, the funding of the, um, the Montpelier descendant advocates, because that's the part that's unique. And I really would like to have us be held accountable for you know, in the mm-hmm. past, when we've done work with descendants and included descendants on programs, the most we've been able to offer descendants is not charging them a fee, which is uh, pretty pathetic. And Lee Anthony, you helped us with that language, you know, years ago. <laughs> you know how to how to phrase this. And what I think would make this grant successful, if we had to cut, would be to um, make sure that we preserve the MDA. The Montpelier Descent Advocate part of it, and then hopefully we'd you know be able to find money elsewhere over the next couple of years to to do the archaeology, you know, because this would fund two years of archaeology. Allison, you're going to add something. Hey, uh, hi everyone. All right, so. Uh, one of the things that we did talk to them about was, and I've talked to Iris and Barbara and Henry about this as well, um, is, you know, when we were sitting in this um, symposium a couple weekends ago, uh, the presenter was talking about ownership, the ownership over a burial site, and what does that look like? Uh, so, you know, we thought, well, what about an easement? What about introducing an easement? And this grant affords that opportunity. So this grant actually allows you to um, uh, fund the legal, sorry, I have it. I might have to move a uh, train going by. Well, can you guys hear me? We can. Yeah. You don't hear the train. It's good. Okay, good. You may, but it's part of the ambiance. It's exciting over here. Um, <laughs> So, um, so one of the things that we talked about was, you know, would it be possible to start the process, the legal process of drawing up the paperwork and going through that to have the MDC's name on the easement so that no one could ever develop this land without the MDC's permission. And I just happened to be able to talk with the National Trust today. And they said, you know what? Yeah, this is absolutely in line with what we're doing right now. And so um, so we just said, Matt and I talked, and we're going to get final sign-off 
um, through in the form of a letter of support to go ahead and at least start that process. Uh, but that would mean that the MDC would have, you know, say in um, in the form of a legal document that says, we do not give permission for anyone to develop this land but us. Uh, so I think that that would be a really powerful thing and also make us more competitive. And, and this is part of what that grant is, has the ability to do is to give that, you know, share that power, you know, give, give that, that um, legal power over to a descendant community in order to, um, you know, create a stronger, uh, a solidify a legal place. Or, or a community, and and um, what is what does everybody think about that? I just had a clarifying question. Is that about the the cemetery, the burial ground specifically that you're talking uh, about the easement? Yeah. Um, once Matt and team defines the extent of the burial ground, right. Uh, that's when, so we would make the case that, like, once we've defined the extent of the burial ground, that four acres, you know, and then some with a memorial um, in front of it, would be an agreement legally binding um, that, that no one could touch that land. It would be a legally binding um, document between the National Trust, the MDC, and the Montpelier Foundation. Right. So the archaeology that this grant al allows to happen is what establishes the boundaries that then you can go get an easement on because you have the boundaries of the cemetery, of the burial ground defined. Yeah. So that's and how it was, plays. Exactly. And, that, and there was some excitement around that today in our conversation. I know that uh, a couple of people were here and, and, you know, they said, and we stood there in the burial ground um, and, and talked about that and they said, yeah, this is really important. And I think that this would go far within the scope of our stewardship, um, goals, um, on African-American sites and that this should be something that we could, and this would be something we, we could automatically support. This would be for the burial ground <laughs> and adjacent area as well. Yeah, and just, so that, that, that two acres that, Henry, that you stood in, the two acres that is potentially site one for the memorial up for discussion, of course, through committee votes. Uh, but that, that and uh, Madeline, you stood there as well. Uh, and Iris, you you were over there. So you know what, what area I'm talking about, which is that, do you want to bring it up on the screen, Matt? And then Barbara has a question. Actually, mine is more common to bring that up. Um, I think what I just heard was the way to make it harder for people to separate out the uh, request into smaller chunks. You know, Matt, you talked about if anything goes, it's the archaeology, it's the advocates that, you know, need to get pushed. But it sounds to me, although we're not 100% hang our hat on this, from what I've just heard, it sounds like it's an interesting part of the framing and if it's part of the framing, then it's harder to say you got to put the archaeology to the side because we need the archaeology in order to do the other work. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it is definitely part of the framework. We go. Chris had a you had a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, um, I think it's a really good idea. Uh, I'm legal land stuff is not my <laughs> my expertise or anything but i do wonder about in the off chance in the future that all of montpelier and the surrounding area of the burial ground got developed i know it's like wild to think about that there would be guarantees of route of access for the community because like i know landlocking can be a big problem with communities being able to access their cemeteries and then also other parks and you know sacred spaces and stuff like that. So that might be something important to consider that uh, public access would be guaranteed if something like that were to happen. Excellent, excellent point that the descendants could always 
access the land and that would be written into the agreement. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent, excellent point. Yeah, it could be a, maybe not developed, but that if Montpelier was closed for an extended period of time because of funding, that there'd be access. That's true, Chris. But that would go into the leak. That that's part of the legal. Yeah, we'd have that, a that would be part of the easement creation process. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about in this instance, right, is just do we do we make this an express goal for this grant? Right. Mm -hmm. That that this by doing this work we clear the path for an easement to happen. It's it's actually a requirement of the grant that um, part of the um, language in the grant is that uh, you either move towards having an easement uh, to protect the land or that you actually do it by the end of the grant. So it's uh, what it oh. says is show how you're going to create an easement to protect the site for the um, community. Okay. It's not a requirement, but it's one of the, 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 the categories in the beginning and the outline of the, of the grant. Um, so it talks about, you know, you can either use this money to create an easement or, you know, to move to le get legal access to land or um, another one was to uh, work on archaeological and do and conduct in archaeological investigations. And I can't remember the third one. I think those are, those pretty much cover it. Becca, any, anyone know? Yeah. I think that's it. Then Lee Anthony has a question. Um, I just had a question. Um, and if you know this, how much time you said it was started in the spring, about how much time would be required for the advocates? Is that like a two year period of time? And would it be, you know, X amount of hours per day? Just kind of what would know what the time, you know, requirements would be. Yeah, for the advocates, it would be, um, there would be, we do a, a training in the spring that would be um, about a, a, altogether about 35 hours that could be spread over a longer period of time for the um, online training. And then there'd be a week, uh, you know, do, for advocates do, working with us on the site uh, to understand, you know, the, the process of archaeology and become more familiar with that. And that would parallel with the uh, the online course. And then uh, following that, there would be um, when we did a, an expedition program, a week long program, we'd want to have at least one advocate be present for that program. And there would be a meeting meeting time before to prep for the expedition, you know, uh, maybe four or five hours before the event and then 35 hours, 35 to 40 hours for that week of the event, and then afterwards some follow-up uh, meetings uh, after that. So it's not not a, not a huge amount of time, but, you know, if people had more time to offer, um, uh, it, it would be available. So we don't want to make it prohibitive, so. Yeah, Iris. I'm not sure why I'm not using my... You know, my icon, I don't know why. But anyway, you know, I don't like, I don't think I like the term advocate. Hmm. But I hesitate to bring it up because At the recording ended. Oh, you got it back on. Okay, thank you. Back on. Yeah, I, I, I've I, lost internet connection with my computer. I'm sorry. I think that's an excellent point. Um, what I would say is, as as you know, we can always change the language. We we can we can use the language for the purposes of getting the grant in by the fifteenth, okay. and then like the re in real time, you know, when we're implementing it, we can change the title 
to whatever you come up with and it won't hurt the grant. Yeah, I kind of think the grant people might like advocate. Allison and Becca, they may like advocate. Yeah, I think they'll like that. They don't want to be too powerful. <laughs> and I, I looked up, I, I'm the one that suggested ambassador, and I looked up ambassador, and, you know, it's, it's someone that's representing another country in a foreign country. And it's just, I, mm -hmm. Becca had concerns with it. And after I read that definition, it really gave me a lot of concerns as well. So yeah. I was like, let's not make ambassadors. So Iris, we can have some fun with the uh, synonyms. <laughs> <laughs> I know this seems like perhaps, uh, but not like, I don't know if it has to have a specific title, but like why even make the differentiation between like an NDC member who becomes a member of the staff and the staff, like they're just as, at that point, they're just as much of an expert as any of the rest of the staff. Like why create a, like a separate group? I don't know if it's required for the parameters of the grant, but I don't. Maybe that's a stupid question. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think if anything, language is important. Mm -hmm. Like, and especially in how language is powerful. I mean, we need to be as powerful collectively as 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 we can. So, I mean, it's a it's a good question. It's a good concern. How we need to be powerful, but not, as Iris said, overly threatening. <laughs> This is Virginia. <laughs> and it's so easy to be overly threatening. You know, it's very easy. That's true. <laughs> I guess this it gets into uh, how, you know, descendant representatives want to be represented. And that is gets into the language. And that would be something definitely for, you know, the MDC to, to, to discuss is, you know, as... Um, archaeologists to participants were present ourselves as archaeologists with with our training and the um what we'd want to need to do is decide what you know what exactly in the role of taking part in these programs descendants would want to be responsible for uh and if that included uh representing the mdc you know so that's where maybe representatives of the mdc and it gets into um, really, you know, thinking critically about the role that descendants have, which is exciting. And it presents, you know, a challenge, but an opportunity as well. Um, and, but what I think what it, what we're, we're looking at right now is that go beyond just participants in the program and, you know, in just, you know, kind of passive participants in the research, but have this role become defined. And this might be something that as, you know, as we start this program, it changes and it's going to, um, uh, you know, as people take part in it, we'll, we'll, be, able, we'll be able to better understand it. It'll also be interesting to see are the same people who are doing the oral history piece also doing the archaeology piece and, and where that overlap happens. But you could certainly, and I have titles for those individuals that are Montpelier descendant oral historian or Montpelier descendant archaeology technician or Montpelier descendant uh, GIS person, you know, whatever <laughs> things that are, that are, um, you know, if the, if the work is similar and the same, you know, the, the job should be titled similarly and it gets across what folks are doing. Um, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, Our I think that maybe, I think Allison might be right in that that's conversations to have. Um, we, we lose a lot of words in the narrative if we try and break down and the sub-definitions of all the different titles. Barbara yeah, has be, her hand up. Um, just to, actually, to uh, support your point, and by the way, I did, of course, look at various definitions of advocate. It might be the best word, don't know yet. But I 
actually favor the idea of the Montpelier descendants X, Montpelier descendants Y, uh, for multiple reasons. It puts us on the map. And the other thing, many of us who are spent parts of our childhood or our summers in the, that area will know there are many, many people, many of our people who will be yet to step foot on that property. And they're not going to until they really feel that there is a home there. And part of establishing that home is not just we do the burial ground, it's our real presence. And our presence, in fact, measured in things like the names that we choose. Hmm. Yes, yeah, that's beautiful, Barbara. And, that, and that's so much of what we're hoping to accomplish with this, this uh, not just the grant, but the idea, and uh, is to have uh, formalized that role of descendants in what we're doing and in, in, in what we're doing is the research. So yeah, thank you, Barbara. At present, I'm having a hard time finding another word to substitute for advocate. Seems to me advocate's <laughs> best word so far. No. Yeah, like Allison said, it might be what we use for this grant and then this gives us something to, th to think about. Well, we're continuing to um, edit the uh, the grant. We, we've got a, um, a a grant writing uh, team tomorrow that's going to look over the grant and do some of the final edit selections. I, uh, Terry made some really good suggestions in the in the grant narrative, and we're we're going to have Anna look over those and and choose between. Um, but is there anything in terms of the the you know the role of uh, the MDAs? We'll leave it in abbreviations um, that we've left out of this, or that um, anybody has a you know a pause or concern about. I'm trying to find my hand here, uh, I think. My only concern, did I raise my hand? Where am I? Okay. Oh, you did, Barbara. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. Hi, I'm here. As long as you can hear me. Oh, here I am. There I am. Okay. Structure. Um, it goes back to my original question about are there any impediments? And the one that I did hear stated, and we all kind of know this, it's like, can you actually find 10 people, 10 local people who will be willing to sign on the dotted line for some of the things that we proposed? So is there a need in terms of getting ahead of a potential objection, anything at all that would need to be said about sourcing them. I don't know what's necessary. I don't write grants, but that would be, because that's the only thing that I've heard that gives me a little pause in terms of if somebody's looking at this, are they gonna start to pick this apart? So how are you gonna get those folks? Seems to well, me, I, oh, go on. I, I don't know, so just a question. Give a shout out to Becca and the work that she's doing right now. Um, and just say that um, she's able to connect with some people mm -hmm. uh, and in a way that I can't. And um, uh, she's, you know, through those oral histories, she's able to spend hours and hours with people um, recording oral histories and spending time in the community. and. Um, more people are interested. We signed people up just this week for the dinner because of that. You know, that probably would be. You've got this incredible bridge that's already being built. Is that reference, and that, it could be, I could have missed it. Is it referenced at some point in this document? Because that speaks directly to we have potential sources and they're local. Can I what? say something? Okay, mm -hmm. and then I'd like to say something after you. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, you know, Montpelier is not really new at this. And I'm looking at Leon Tenet, and I'm thinking of other people who've been involved over the years. So I don't have that, I don't, I don't have that issue. But I do think, as Barbara said, you know, in the the uh grant, um if the funders know that Montpelier, this is what Montpelier has been doing all these years, uh, maybe that will, you know, ease, 
he's any concerns that they have, although I mm -hmm. just, I don't see that as an issue. Mm -hmm. even for them. I'm sorry, Madeline. No. Well, I guess as I read through it, and I did see the connection with Ocas. Am I saying this correct? Uh, Matt. Ocas. Uh, the Orange County African American Historical Society. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about people like Bruce and then Joanne and, um, and Becca. And the fact that um, in addition to reaching out to persons who may be um, slightly older adults, the fact that there is opportunity for um, looking at persons who may have been high school graduates or um, college uh, people of, of whatever, um, I think, you know, that is an opportunity because when, for high school graduates in Orange who, let's say, maybe are not really at this point pursuing a college education, I don't know what real job opportunities are out there for people. So I think, you know, even with that, with the grant offering those as options and the fact that it does mention this partnership with the um, African American Historical Society and other organizations in Orange. I, and maybe it needs to be um, spelled out more clearly in the grant, but I don't see it as a problem to find 10 people. Oh, I, I doubt, I know we'll find 10 people. I don't want anybody else to read this. And Iris just made a great point that this is something that's going on for a long, 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 long time. Yeah. Not new, new. And to that extent, the grant needs to reflect that. And I'm not saying it doesn't, but that's that's probably the most important thing. This is not new ground. It's just being plowed a little differently. I wonder, so kind of two things. First, there is something sort of implied by a grant written by the MDC that says we're going to hire MDC and Orange County African American Historical Society members to do this work. It sort of it implies that that exists, <laughs> like the, the people are there. Um, but also, I mean, you all just listed off a number of people who you think would probably be interested. Would it be possible to get even just soft commitments or commitments that are enough from some folks to say, we've got 10 people. They're ready to go. We just don't have the money to pay them yet. Um, and they aren't, they aren't trained. Um, I mean, there's, we've got half the number on the call right now. So, you know, uh, does, Do. I don't know. I just, I don't know if that number exists or not, but that would really strengthen the grant. If you said, if it was able to say, we already have the people, the question is the resources. And that's why we're coming to you. You mm -hmm. We've got letters of support uh, from um, from uh, Bruce Monroe from the OCHS. Uh, uh, Dr. Ford and Dr. Blakey are writing a letter as advisors. And I, I think we're only allowed three letters. And the um, archaeology department, we're, we're writing a letter of support to talk about some of what you're talking about, Terry, and what, Iris, you said, the history of working with the community. So I think we can we can cover cover that. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it might be difficult to get um, commitment from ten people in a week for this, you know, without understanding what the scope would be. But I I think we'll ha we'll have this in the letters, and I'm gonna I'm gonna um, edit the uh, letter that Bruce is writing to to indicate support for finding people. Mm -hmm. So Chris, can you I had your... say before Chris talks? Um, sure. I'm sorry, Chris. You know, that's the way I am. Well, I, am <laughs> um, I like what Terry says. I mean, it's a good good idea in any grant to have letters of support, whatever. But the fact that uh, the MDC and the Orange County folks are saying, this is what we're, we want to do, needs, I think that's good enough. Good. We're writing that grant. 
-hmm. And we'll just, you know, I think that's good enough. Sorry, Chris. Uh, it's totally fine. Um, I was hoping I get, I basically was going to say that you've mentioned in the past, Dr. Ford, um, the idea of us kind of going out and doing like re doing kind of community outreach stuff anyways and building building up momentum and interest and my reservation of what you were saying terry uh and getting fully 10 people with commitments as it doesn't leave open the door of potentially mm -hmm. like maybe some of that money being there to pay for the time spent to build pathway programs through community mm -hmm. outreach and get new new people um uh, high school graduates, like you mentioned, Madeline, um, kind of wanting to get their foot in the door now and early um, and kind of build. Like we've seen it already with people who came on high school expeditions and then they get their master's degrees in archaeology. Like that's a, that we're a good stepping stone place for that anyways, but using using this as an opportunity to build that with the, the local high school as well. Um, and I don't know if, Matt, there's room for like, some of that, I know it's not really in our model right now and how we have done community stuff, but for in part of the internship program, if doing community outreach at the local high school to build this and could be, I don't know, I'm just kind of word vomiting out loud, but I don't know if that made sense. Mm -hmm. I think it did. And that's actually kind of exactly what I was going to say. I mean, yes, it would be awesome if we had 10 people going right in, but I'm not going to lie. My ulterior motive is to, is to rope younger individuals into the MDC to get involved and to, again, make uh, Montpelier not such a white space. Um, and to I, honestly, like when I first got there, it, I, it scared the piss out of me, like stepping onto that, that landscape. And I still am slightly uneasy every day I go into work. But I mean, if I saw more pe people of color, it might be a better, not better, but, you know, kind of more welcoming. So that's what I'm really hoping that this money, this funding can do is rope some of the, the um, local descendant communities all various ages into participating in this in this history. You know, if we can, and if I were writing this grant, the cover sheet would have an image of Leontine holding her famous artifact with a little, just a little something underneath. Leontine is holding the artifact. And I think that says it all. Well, we are allowed to add, um, add pictures into the um, well, that's a part good of the grant application. Mm -hmm. I'm adding that now. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, the I'm one you sure. don't want to use is me sitting in the chair watching other people dig. That's still a good one, Iris. Come on, because there's all <laughs> participation. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're an enabler in that way because yeah, yeah. Wants to be digging, so. you're an investigator <laughs> oh, watch that language ladies. watch watch the language <laughs> yeah but i i really uh, the investigator of color image, and there are others there are others yeah yeah and joanne <laughs> i mean yeah, and even have you those people and there yeah. are and there are others that you have from years back. Mm -hmm. And hopefully Diane is going to come dig with us in the fall. So yeah, Diane. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yes. Hope you get that grant so you can pay for my travel. <laughs> <laughs> and housing. Oh, so <laughs> she's decided she's going to be an MDA. Yes. <laughs> have I? Yeah, you you already have one commitment. Now. That sounded uh, like a commitment no. to me, and we've got it recorded, right? So. We <laughs> <laughs> well, I did read in the grant that it said local, and I'm not local, so I don't. So, what does local mean? You have to define that. Yeah. I I do want to edit that, um, Diane, because with the, the way we run this, is that uh, the MDAs would be part of the. Um, 
you know, preparing for and being part of the one week expeditions. So there'd be a chance to have uh, MDAs have fun st travel stipends as well, in addition to their pay. So we'd be able to combine that. So that's a little nuance that we'd, we're, we'd work out with the grant. And to, to speak to, to your, you know, your point, Chris, and, and, and uh, also your point, Becca, one of the things in the um, budget that I put in for the um, proposal coming from archeology span department is the funding for this grant for archaeology would pay for our internship program and the specifics of an internship program would be to fund BIPOC students coming from our field school and to have an immediate increase in the number of you know uh, people of color that are on the staff with the archaeology department like this year we're hoping that we you know from our interns would from the field school, we'll be able to hire at least two or three um, uh, black archaeologists, which would be great, and really begin to make this into a space that looks like a safe space for black people. Mm -hmm. And Diane will recruit from afar. As yeah. an MBA, she'll be going to uh, festivals and events in the Chicago area, getting them to <laughs> know more about Montpelier and become involved. <laughs> I certainly <know. laughs> And that's definitely a role of the MDAs is that we'd want to have, you know, uh, to use uh, Ural's networks to get more people to, to come to Montpelier and to come to come and be aware of our program. So absolutely. See, see your Chicago map on the, on the wall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, when I, when I retired from the Chicago Children's Museum, the staff presented that map because I was a community partnership manager and I was all over Chicago. So most of those communities, especially the ones that were low income communities where I did my work. So that's why the map. <laughs> I have all kinds of ideas for us, Diane. This is great. <laughs> and Hello, then I'm Diane. Very... Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, um, this is Tammy Gibson. I'm from Chicago. What? Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, so I just well, heard you saying this, wanted to give a shout out. So I will definitely spread the word um, whenever I can about Mount Pillar. Tammy, are you in Chicago now or where are you? Yes, I live. Yeah, I live in Chicago. Oh, cool. Are you related? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, well, related I mean, to Diane. Gibson is my married name. Maybe we oh. have to <laughs> um, um, I don't know. We got to have to uh, talk. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, I'll send you my number. <laughs> okay. Uh, and can I just say that uh, the MDC should know that Tammy and Diane are both in Chicago. Absolutely. You are correct about that, Iris. I have a I have a question for Diane. Um, it's kind of unrelated. Um, did you do work? in Virginia research for Hugh Blair Grigsby? Family I research? I recognize. Yes. Um, uh, for Hugh, Hugh Blair, uh, I thought I recognized your name for um, doing um, some data from the Hugh Blair Grigsby um, archives. Mm -hmm. I think I recognized your name, uh, but I could be totally wrong. Um, I think I've seen a picture of you. I was researching my ancestor who was a slave in, uh, under Hugh Blair Grigsby. He, he was in, uh, in, uh, Courthouse, Virginia. And he's, you know, he was a big historian and, and, um, I think president of William and Mary at one point. And I just, you know, I was gathering data from, all his records and found my great grandmother in there. And I thought that perhaps you were one of the ones extracting the data. Um, I thought I, I saw your name. I'm so was... sorry. I'm so sorry. It's just your name, okay. uh, Diane. I, I saw Diane. I was like, I wonder but if I'm, I'm all done. over Ancestry 23 and Me Family yeah. Search. Oh, okay. And I do have connections with genealogists here in Chicago that have Virginia roots. They're oh, okay. there, Orange, Virginia. Uh -huh. There are a few that do have Virginia roots. Yeah, my family was from um, um, Culpeper County. Mm. Um, mm. Yes. 
which was, I believe if I'm right, um, Matt, the orange and call pepper were kind of one at one time or parts of it. I can't remember. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and mm -hmm. by the way, Diane, I'm not from Chicago, but I have a friend in Chicago that gave me <laughs> the <this> shoe. <laughs> Chicago <laughs> Fire Department shirt on. Well, I was a firefighter, but we used to trade t shirts. So, yeah, <laughs> hey, good friend. That's, all right. Thanks for answering my question. Where Sorry are you from now? Where are you now? I'm in South Carolina right now. I'm originally okay. from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, my folks uh, migrated from Virginia into D.C., uh, spent a little time in Philadelphia, and then made their way over to Pittsburgh, um, mm -hmm. made their way over there around 1900. Um, Might be related to some Orange County people. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, yes. Orange County, Orange to Pittsburgh, there were quite a few mm -hmm. people, too. Yeah. I, I'm hoping to find, I hit a brick wall in, um, um, in, um, Courthouse, Virginia, under Hugh Blair Grigsby. That's the last known place. I got lucky, and he kept he kept one document from my great great grandmother. She when she migrated to D.C., she wrote him a letter, and he um, apparently answered it. Um, and it was about whether some of her family members were still with him. And um, so I know that that's the last Virginia place that she was. Or between a certain time period, right after emancipation until D.C., she could have traveled, made her way up to D.C. Um, but that's uh, my grandfather was born in Virginia. Um, his sister. So by the time she got to D.C., she had another little one. Um, but I'm, I'm still I'm still trying to get the rest of the information. I know I I, I believe there's more in the archives for um, Hugh Blair Grigsby. Um, it's just getting the information is kind of tough. Um, We're gonna make that connection, Gina, so. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, and I got some walk. She's metal detecting with us, so she's okay. and looking forward to Gina coming up and helping in the burial ground. Yeah, so. um, soon, well, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah Dennis. Okay. He'll be out there in a, in a week. He's with his dad right now. He's very ill. Yeah. So. Yeah, right, right. I spoke with him. Yeah. Well, okay. The electronic gods are not favoring me tonight because I'm on my phone and I'm at 10%. So I'm waiting for my phone. <laughs> <to> <laughs> but um, really uh, appreciate the, the input for, for the grant. And uh, we'll, um, as we get the, uh, the final of this completed, we'll send it out to you all, complete with all the pictures. And your, your picture as well, Leon, to me, if you're still on, the, on here. So, but um, anybody else, anyone else have anything else to add? Or, and if you think of anything later, please email us, you know, email the whole group and we'll, um, we'll get this worked in. So, all right, well, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate the time. We all appreciate the time tonight and the support you all are giving us for this. And uh, nice to nice have nice takes takes a uh, takes a village to do this. <laughs> you all are a village. Everyone. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.